This is a show that we do here in uh, Cable uh, 17, uh, Cox Cable 7, I mean, Santa Barbara TV, Cable Channel 17, and uh, we'd cover issues that we think are of interest to liberal and progressive uh, viewers around uh, the, the county uh, who might have access to it uh, by that method on cable television, and also from those who might uh, see us on Ustream or YouTube. And uh, today we are really honored to have with us uh, to discuss one of the really topical issues of international moment uh, is David Krieger, who is president of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation. Uh, David's show, uh, David's experience in, involved being a negotiator or a, a, an attendee for decades, I think, at various conferences attempting to resolve some of the confrontation issues about the implementation of the nuclear non-proliferation treaties and try to get this uh, nuclear disarmament uh, extended and well, other things such as that. Yes, yes well, I, I've been with the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation from the beginning in 1982 and we've attended uh, many, many conferences including the non-proliferation treaty review conferences as a civil society organization, and I've represented the foundation. Yeah, we said at you were in Vienna uh, at one of these uh, programs. As I, I was in Vienna in December for mm -hmm. a conference on the humanitarian impacts of nuclear weapons. So uh, safe to say that you stay uh, in touch and aware of uh, what's going on, and um, you can get information about the, the organization that Davis is involved in. And call it at wagingpeace.org uh, website for the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation. Right, that's our principal website, wagingpeace.org. We have two others, nuclearfiles.org and nuclearzero.org. Okay. Um, so let's focus uh, more narrowly uh, on the question of the, of the day, which is what has happened uh, with regard to the uh, continuing uh, pre uh, tension uh, with regard to Iran. Uh, uh, there is such a thing as the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Very important treaty. And yeah. Iran is, I think, a signatory to that. It is. It's a party to the treaty. So of all the nations in the world, uh, uh, who, there are some nations who are signatories to this, there are some who are not signatories uh, to this. Almost all nations in the world are signatories. The only four that are not are Israel, India, Pakistan, and North Korea. And how many of them have nuclear weapons? And they all have nuclear weapons. Okay. They've all stayed outside the boundaries of the treaty and they've all developed nuclear weapons. However, we believe that uh, with so many countries in the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, that those who are out are still bound by the dictates of the Non-Proliferation Treaty through customary international law. Well, look, I guess my point here I want to try to get to as quick as I could is that Iran um, has been compliant with its obligations under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. That's right. No, nobody is claiming that it has not. Right. And it's submitted itself to inspection. It's uh, agreed uh, to have uh, limits on its product productions of certain kinds of uh, radioactive materials. Right. Um, the Non-Proliferation Treaty is a bit of a misnomer in the title of the treaty because it actually has three principal components. The first is to prevent the proliferation of nuclear weapons. The second is to level the playing field by calling for negotiations in good faith for an end to the nuclear arms race and nuclear disarmament, so all of the parties to the Non-Proliferation Treaty are required to engage in negotiations in good faith for nuclear disarmament. And the third pillar of the Non-Proliferation Treaty is uh, they, what they call uh, an inalienable right to nuclear power. They be uh, the, the treaty the, the treaty, treaty language. The treaty language. But, you can see with the situation with Iran that there's a definite tension between those pillars. If you want non-proliferation, you make it much harder by uh, encouraging nuclear power. And it's also, it also becomes much more difficult 
when the nuclear weapon states, parties to the treaty, do not fulfill their obligations for nuclear disarmament. Well, okay, let me back up a bit here. And, and, and my, my point to this point was that Iran is a member of the, of the non-proliferation group. It's complied, it's, with, the treaty. it's complied with its treaty obligations to date, as far as is known. That's correct. Approved. They claim that they, uh, and you, as you point out, all the members that are allowed, theoretically allowed, to use atomic uh, nuclear power for domestic ge generation of electricity and power. Right. Peaceful purposes. Peaceful as purposes. They call it. Uh, medical care or other things. The, um, and so they claim, of course, that Iranian have claimed forever that this is what they're trying to do. That's right. Any, any country that wants to hold open the option to become a nuclear weapons country will claim that they want to develop nuclear because, power for peaceful purposes. Because it is possible to take the same um, radioactive material that you use for, for nuclear generating power and refine or, or uh, uh, make that more potent, which right. would be up to what, what they call weapons-grade material. So there's actually two, two materials from which bombs are made, from which nuclear weapons are made. The first is uranium, and in a natural state, uranium-235 is less than 1% of the amount of natural uranium and it has to be what they call enriched, or that the part of it, the uranium-235, needs to be brought up to about 90%. Okay. So the Iranians have been enriching uranium up to approximately 20%. And they do this with uh, various technologies, and it's the fact that they've increased this technology that makes people suspicious of their purpose. That's, the, the, the that's right. But once you start enriching uranium, you, you have the option to continue enriching uranium to a higher level, and then you have bomb-grade material. Mm -hmm. A second bomb-grade material is plutonium, which is a byproduct of fissioning uranium. And um, you need to repro reprocess plutonium to make nuclear weapons. So if you have nuclear power generating facilities, you would perhaps have a supply of that as well. That's right. In most cases, whether or not you can reprocess is another matter. And that's... Uh, I think uh, one of the worst uh, byproducts or w worst consequences of the no Fukushima disaster is there's, I think, plutonium still there uh, in the destruction of that facility that right. they can't get out. That's right. So. Plut and plutonium is a very dangerous material. Yeah. Uh, less than a microgram, if inhaled, will almost certainly cause lung cancer. Right. So the issue here is that, um, well, I, the, uh, the pressure has been, let, let's talk about which countries are involved in negotiating with Iran about what Iran is doing, ostensibly doing. Uh, they're not just the United States. I think the American right. public is often misunderstands that. They, they call them the P5 plus one. And P5 stands for the permanent five members of the United Nations Security Council. It's the United States, Russia, UK, France, and China. And the plus one is Germany. So it's those six countries that are negotiating with Iran. And the and each of, each of these countries seems to have a fairly strong suspicion uh, or, or, or certainly a cynicism about Iran's claims that they're not doing anything that they're not allowed to do, but there is no evidence that they have done anything they weren't allowed to do as yet, as I understand it. In fact, didn't the United States, uh, uh, back in the early, maybe 10 years ago, in the, in the Bush administration, I think the the U.S. Uh, spy people said that they were convinced that the Iranians have given up their bomb-making ambitions as far back as 2003. I'm not sure about that. I think that may have been something they said about Iraq ah. prior to the Iraq well, War. That was another, that was another <laughs> false. <laughs> you know, it, yeah. it was pretty clear that yeah. Iraq had stopped trying to become a nuclear uh, power. Maybe I, maybe I was... 
my mind is uh, tending to confuse those countries sometimes, maybe. Um, anyway, so what has happened with this negotiation and how it's been going on for about four or five years now? It's been going on for a while. They've been trying to trying to reach an agreement in which they the P5 plus one and the rest of the world feel comfortable that Iran does not have a path pathway to a nuclear weapon. And um, recently they announced the completion of a framework agreement. It's not a final agreement, it's just a framework for agreement. And uh, Ern Ernest Moniz, who's the United States uh, Secretary of Energy, who's been involved in the negotiations uh, in recent times, uh, he says that he feels confident that the framework they've agreed to allows no pathway to a bomb. Yeah, I, I just I, you know I've seen programs on this path using this pathway language, and I think I comprehend it, but I want to make sure that it's understandable. You mentioned that they can uh, they can obtain weapon quote unquote weapons grade fissionable material in more than one way. Right. Through, that, through enriching pathways, uranium, the pathways. Through, right. So through enriching uranium or reprocessing plutonium, and parts of the framework agreement uh, limit the number of centrifuges, limit them to uh, old centrifuges, and uh, the United States and the other members of the negotiating countries believe that they're not that with the restrictions placed on on them they're not going to be able to enrich uranium secretly and have enough uranium to make a bomb so mm -hmm. and and they also feel they've blocked through uh, agreements with regard to current power plants in uh, Iran that they'll make the Iranians will make changes which will be inspected, which will also preclude the possibility of plutonium being used for a bomb. So they would, they, and they also have fairly rigorous inspections. I think uh, 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 they're going to be there daily or weekly in, in some of these facilities? Right. There's, there's, a, there's a strong inspection regime going primarily through the International Atomic Energy Agency. And the International Atomic Energy Agency has actually conducted inspections in uh, Iran, I think, over the last several years. Yes. With, without, with, with fairly, uh, they seem to feel, be comfortable that the information they got was reliable. Seems to be. Yeah. They haven't complained, they haven't mm -hmm. given any indication that they think Iran is trying to develop nuclear weapons. The other thing I would like, I mean, just before we get into the politics of that in this country, to I'm sure that we'll have some discussion about that. But I'd like to talk a little bit of why we're so suspect of um, Iranian protestations that it is not engaging in, in, a, in a, an attempt to build a bomb. Um, we have them deny it officially. Of course, that doesn't mean a lot. I mean, a lot of countries deny, as you say, uh, that they have this goal. Uh, but they have, uh, their, their, the religious leadership has said that there's a, a fatwa, a religious prohibition in their mind, in their religion, against the concept of even owning or using, much less using nuclear weapons. So there's a moral claim that they will not use them. What, what makes us suspicious that they're up to this? Well, I, I think we viewed, we have viewed in the United States, Iran, as an enemy country going back quite a ways. Uh, and the Iranians uh, have been unhappy with the United States uh, since we overthrew Mossadegh sure. long ago, since the CIA did that. Yeah, back in the 50s, and <laughs> installed a, a dictator, dictatorship with right. some pretty harsh right. people. So, you know, and I. Additionally, I think Israel plays a role in this. Israel is worried that Iran might develop nuclear weapons, which would be a threat to Israel, as they see it. Um, they're not willing to accept that Iran, even if they develop nuclear weapons, might be doing it for purposes of, de of deterrence, nuclear deterrence. 
there's a lot of irony in that. Yes. You know, Netanyahu, Prime Minister Netanyahu, came at the invitation of the Republican Congress and spoke to them about his concerns, but not one of them asked Netanyahu about Israel's nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. So we're, there's some very serious double standards. Well, there is a double standard and in, in some form of bias here in the sense that we are willing to trust that the Israelis will not use any of, well, they have 300 potentially? The estimates range between 100 and 400. 200 is the most common figure that's so used. They've got um, certainly maybe 200 uh, nuclear weapons, in, um, and yet we don't demand that they even disclose the existence of these weapons. Right. I think these double standards are a huge problem. And I think in, until all the countries with nuclear weapons get on the same page and start fulfilling their obligations to negotiate, mm -hmm in good faith for nuclear disarmament, we're going to have problems. I mean, just the fact that the United States, just the fact that the P5, the United States, Russia, UK, France, and China maintain nuclear arsenals is a big incentive to other countries to try and develop nuclear arsenals. It is, uh, because it makes you a player in the game. It makes you go, yeah, people makes have to you pay attention. makes you think you're a player in well, the game. They, they think and they are. and that, that's exactly the case with India and Pakistan. North Korea. North Korea, I think, has some true issues of wanting to keep the giants off their back. Mm -hmm. um, well, but, we'll but, but the same applies. So we're going back to this thing. Now, now we've negotiated the framework as, there, as you described it and others have, and we have a few more weeks, months, uh, till June to come up with uh, actual implementation agreement. Um, and, and that would involve these inspections and a uh, series of uh, restrictions that would last for a decade to 15 years, as I understand it. Yeah, certain parts of it last for 10 years, other parts last for 15, and as I understand it, some parts are indefinite. But there's concern now that after 10 years that the Iranians then will be able to get newer style right. uh, enrichment devices, which will shorten the breakout time Of course, that implies that, that's, that, the, I mean, it, that still implies what hasn't yet been proved, that they really do want a bomb. Exactly. And, and that, you know, that offends me, because we know that I mean, if you always assume that you're, the people you're negotiating with are unreliable and untrustworthy and, they, and that they're trying to do exactly the opposite of what they say they are trying to do and that you can't have any relationship with them in the future, it, 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 you're not going to get very far. Uh, well, yes, that's true, but in the case of nuclear weapons, I think you, you don't want to err on the side of uh, trust. Right. Where, you know, I think there's some there's verification issues well, uh, that need, need to be there, but it again points up the the huge discrepancy and dual standard in mm -hmm. the system. Uh, I don't think the Iranians particularly trust the United States, also, but there are not going to be any uh, intense inspection regime for the. The United States, that's not part of the negotiation, but but it should be. All countries should be subject to intense negotiations. Without, without, yes, without intention. getting off track or too far, I, I'm, I'm thinking that back in the late, in the 80s, it was it, 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 back when Ronald Reagan negotiated with the Russians, the Soviet right. Union then, he unilaterally agreed to reduce American stockpiles and trust them to do what we had inspection processes for doing it. As, you know, and, 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 but it happened. I mean, you had to trust to a certain degree and verify it. That was his famous quote. Right. Yeah, trust but verify. Yeah, that and was and it seems to me that that's where we are here uh, with this Iranian situation. Uh, trust but verify. Uh, trust that they will do what they promise to do, but verify that they're doing it. All for the good of having, reducing the threat to the world. We don't want any more countries to have nuclear weapons. Right. With, with each new country that develops nuclear weapons, the world becomes increasingly dangerous. The threat grows. But we also don't want to allow the status quo 
to go on indefinitely. And that's part of existing international law. The countries that have nuclear weapons must negotiate to eliminate them. So, you know, we can spend time on Iran now. I think it's worthwhile to do that. The New York Times has already published an editorial by its editorial board saying, after Iran, we should go and pay attention to Pakistan and India. Yes. And that's true, too. But we can't be running around putting out nuclear fires here, there, and everywhere. I mean, maybe we need to do that, but there's a, a systemic issue here, and the, and the systemic issue is that no nuclear weapons are legitimate. They're all illegal, immoral, and, um, and just basically wrong. Wrong. So let's get back to the politics of it here. I mean, um, we, you, you and I would agree without regard to the, uh, maybe the bias or the uh, hostility toward uh, Iran versus another nuclear, a presently powerful Pakistan or India. I mean, we just made a, a treaty with India to help them expand their nuclear power uh, businesses. But without regard to all those possible, those weird side effects. Right, in India, you've got to keep in mind, India is a nuclear proliferator. Right. It is. And a country that never joined the non-proliferation right. treaty. And, and, uh, and we're helping them. Um, and yet we're trying to stop a country who's been participant in the, pro in the, in the treaty has complied with its obligations as far as can be proven, and is promising not to go any further. Uh, we're now, in, 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 this has become a big political football in the United States. And there's two things about that that I would like you to th talk about, because you've seen this from an international perspective much more than most people in this country might. Uh, we, we started off by pointing out that the, the participants in this treaty negotiation were the United States, Russia, China, France, the United Kingdom, and Germany. Right. If the United States um, domestic politics is such that the Congress refuses to uh, validate or allow the President of the United States to engage in the, the traditional and historic rights of a President, and we a, a, in the United States didn't sign on in this, what, what effect might that have in the totality of its implementation Otherwise, is is it possible these other these other nations could continue the the, the program? Uh, I think it's unlikely. I think it's it's quite possible that if the Congress you know balks at the agreement that's presented by the administration, that that could kill the deal. The other country, and that, and that would be and that would be a far worse situation. Uh, explain that. I mean. If the Congress balks at the deal, mm -hmm. doesn't agree to the deal, then there will be pressures on the United States to do other, you know, to take more other aggressive moves, action. more aggressive action, and up to and including war against Iran. Uh, yeah, I think that needs to be pointed out uh, more explicitly because the other side, the side of the Congress, if you believe their protestations, and I'm suspect, I, I don't know that their protestations are exactly valid. I, I think they're saying things for political purposes that they may or may not feel and they know better then. But if you believe what they're saying, they want harsher uh, penalties, more economic sanction, and maybe even uh, to go in and try to physically bomb or take out uh, the Iranian facilities. If that is the alternative to this treaty, things were going to be... A That's a very bad alternative. Very, very dangerous alternative. And we would have to... We, you know, we've... We, we've, we've the United States has already done more than enough damage in the Middle East and created a, a, a pretty untenable situation there by our illegal war, aggressive war against Iraq to start with. So Iraq is a relatively small country by comparison to Iran. Oh, I know. And the... The, Iran is a sophisticated nation of a large population that's much... much the, the, stake, the stakes are much, much higher yeah. with Iran. And if we're doing that just because of Israel, it's even worse. But that's my view. Um, and also what bothers me is that we've got... If, 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 if Russia, China, 
Russia and China can get together, and Russia, China, France can get together, and Russia, China, France, and United Kingdom and Germany can get together with Iran and, and think that this is an acceptable and, and, and honorable and verifiable deal, and the United States is one that, that scotches that, uh, then we become, then we have hostility with these nations, these other nations that we normally would, not, we, we would want to have better relationships with. Well, I think it's very likely that they would join with us in any kind of aggression against Iraq, Iran. No, I, I'm wondering about that. I don't think, I'm not sure the rush would do it when they have a, 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 a framework and a treaty that th these countries have also said they think is acceptable. And then just because the United States Congress puts a, right. a, 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 a sabot in the in the gears, uh, the rest of the, the world are supposed to follow in line to American policy? I don't, I don't think that's well, I, No, I, I, that's not what I'm oh, okay. saying. I don't think the other countries would go along with the United States. Uh, I don't think they would, you, I don't think they would support the United States in taking aggressive action against Iran and that's, uh, after uh, having right. killed this deal that all the countries, exactly. including the United States, government has worked so hard to achieve. Yeah, that was the point I was saying. I'm sorry I misunderstood uh, the point there. We got crossed up. But, so we agreement. So yeah. there's multiple, multiple ways that this present circumstance can damage both American domestic uh, and international stat, uh, prestige or status or power and the world's balance of power regarding atomic weaponry and uh, the control or limiting of uh, nuclear uh, danger. You know, again, I want to emphasize the importance of looking at this systemically. The idea that we can have a world with nuclear haves being a small number of countries and nuclear have-nots being all the rest of the countries in the world and that those nuclear haves will just be lit, will just be able to go on uh, having these weapons, threatening these, the use of these weapons, uh, using them for their own military purposes, is really very hard to believe is sure. possible. So, Iran is just we're one just, We're going situation. to wind up for this, this, a couple of things. Sure. How can people uh, maybe affect uh, for this for the positive? Con contact Congress, uh, talk to their friends, uh, contact your organization. Is there anything else you could recommend that people could do who want to further this uh, arrangement, this potential? We, we have an action alert that's just come out that allows people to send a message to their congressional representatives telling them to support the framework agreement. And, and, and where can they get that? They can get that, starting with, they can get that at wagingpeace.org. Okay. on the internet and they can also uh, reach out to us uh, in other ways. Okay. okay.